going to talk about the uh, question of uh, innovation. And uh, my essential message really is that uh, carbon pricing is not going to be sufficient and we have to embrace other instruments and among those I would rank innovation as the highest. So I'll work on that kind of theme and end up with some questions addressed specifically to our situation here in, uh, in Europe. Uh, I have a mug, which of course isn't quite this peculiar shape from my last time here, and every announcement that President Trump made about climate, I would fill my European University Institute mug with coffee and that calm me down a little bit, so it's uh, great to be back. Thank you. Um, I think it's the importance of civility can hardly be uh, under stated. I think I love Harry Ayer's point where he says some of the most terrible events in recent history began with outbreaks of incivility long before Jews or Bosnian Muslims or ethnic Albanians at Kosovo were massacred. They were insulted. Um, and I think the, uh, the kind of crazy times we're in essentially is about a loss of civility. I won't read uh, this lovely poem by Charles Simic, the extract from it, but essentially lack of civility leads to, of course, catastrophe ultimately. Um, and here in uh, Florence, of course, we're in a place where the human impulse to challenge orthodoxy all began. Uh, our, and my particular strand of environmental economics, plays a huge focus on realism, evidence, commitment to truth, and of course that is the ultimate signature of what Florence gave to the world. And uh, the personalities that did that and essentially transformed the way we think about ourselves and about our lives uh, all started here. So being here for me is very, very special. Um, the purpose of what I'm about is really to generate a conversation about carbon reducing innovation, what it means, how to generate it, why it should be given parity of esteem with getting the prices right, and what Europe should do. Um, we should be modest. I love this graph which I just saw recently. Um, the arrow to the left is the actual uh, annual additions uh, to uh, um, solar. And the lines going out to the right are the projections in the world, uh, the yearbook, energy yearbook every year. And you can see a complete disconnect. And uh, I think it's a wonderful antidote when we're making forecasts to realize that what we see as think is happening and what actually happens can be dramatically at odds. Uh, we have talent in this room today, of course, that know a lot more than I do about innovation. We have um, Corrado is here and Julie is here and uh, there, issue will also be addressed tomorrow. So I'm not exactly a dabbler in this space, but I don't have the expertise that a lot of folks in our company here do have. Um, first proposition, carbon pricing is necessary, of course, but not sufficient. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs uh, made this quote some 10 years ago now about how easy global warming is to solve, and I won't read through what he has to say. Um, but it's the kind of uh, statement that makes people in the Environmental Defense Fund and anybody who's actually trying to get action to happen uh, chewing the carpet because, of course, it's hellishly difficult to uh, solve the problem generally. And, of course, it's especially hard to get a carbon price in place and to stay in place that does what needs to be uh, done. Um, there's one exception, Thomas Sterner, who's another eerie former president, um, you know, keeps coming back to the point that we do have one carbon tax that's very high and has been dramatically effective where it's been allowed to operate, and that's high fuel taxation, which of course Europe has been the lead in. 
And the relative performance of European transport fuel emissions versus the US, of course, is largely a function, not entirely, but largely a function of the differential in uh, taxes. But in general, the tax levels are low. This is a wonderful graph from the um, World Bank report a few months ago it came out, but essentially it shows, uh, it's hard to read the numbers, but on the left hand side you have the price of carbon and uh, along the bottom you have the uh, years. Um, but essentially the carbon prices we do have uh, are all clustered, nearly all clustered down in the 20 five and below levels, with a very few outliers uh, above that. So the actual performance in terms of, of carbon pricing, both through trading and through uh, taxes, uh, the reality is extremely uh, modest and not anywhere close to what they would need to be to achieve what needs to be achieved. And of course we have this, I think, what we could think about really as perhaps a tax ceiling demonstration. Uh, we have the gilets jaunes, which may well have been part of the fact that reason why I missed my pl flight in Paris yesterday uh, to Florence. Um, but essentially there's this uh, resistance uh, to fuel prices that are tied to the tax that's been recently introduced here in, Fra in, our, in France. Um, I think the quote below is quite important. It's from the Irish Times uh, last week. Several police unions have expressed sympathy and promised not to punish petty or middle-sized offences out of solidarity with the citizens. Um, when you get that kind of um, sentiment becoming uh, uh, kind of mainstreamed in a way, you're probably all looking at at, uh, at a tax ceiling. Uh, and so it all feeds into the narrative, I suppose, that we have to look to other instruments in order to achieve what needs to be achieved. Um, so I'm moving on now to talk about, well, maybe I should pause here for a second and just get a sense of the room as to whether you agree with that proposition that the tax instrument on its own is not going to get us there. Plus, use of the revenues. I mean, to package the tax, but also say what you do with the revenues. Okay, and would that get us to where we need? I mean, would we get a high enough do you, th do you think the political economy of a carbon tax is such that you could introduce a very high tax if you gave it back smartly? It would make, make it more, uh, uh, would make more sense as well, not just because... I think uh, people who pay for the tax would see more... Would, given that they cannot get all the benefits of that kind of tax because they are in the Far away in the future, most of them would be a way of, uh, uh, for them to uh, benefit more of the contribution to the solution of the public, uh, public problem that we have. So it may, it's, not, it's not just a way of pleasing people and buying their support, but it's also made an economic sense. Sure. I mean, that is the British Columbia model, as you know, that you get an actual check that says, here's your money back. Other thoughts? Yeah. It's pretty clear it's not technologically feasible at the moment to achieve sufficient decarbonization. So, per force, you have to have innovation. Thank you, Chuck. That's a very compelling complimentary argument. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'll keep uh, going. Um, uh, the kind of sources I've used uh, I, as uh, features editor of REAP, um, I got um, Cameron Hepburn and a team to put together a literature review and a kind of an analysis in this space. Um, but I'm going to lean uh, on American experience. It's a bit counterintuitive, but the US has made some surprising progress, mainly through uh, innovation. So I thought I'd 
dwell a little bit on that experience. Uh, the other strand from the US that's, I think, particularly useful in Europe is the whole you know, venture capital uh, process. Um, essentially, venture capital is a way of bringing new entrants into the uh, innovation transformation process and without new entrants you're stuck with incumbents and when you're stuck with incumbents you're probably not going to get dramatic uh, change so it's quite an important dimension of the american experience that's relevant to us the thing i haven't talked about is or won't talk about is china because i don't know enough uh, about it it has of course played a key role in reducing the cost of renewables through manufacturing scale um, but I won't kind of plod through them, but I think there are at least five very good reasons why China is quite likely over the next 10 to 20 years become the key player in the kind of innovation, uh, innovation space. But it deserves a separate uh, presentation and topic. Also, we don't have kind of exposed evidence to look at uh, in China because most of what we're talking about is ex ante, a future uh, scenario. So it doesn't lend itself to kind of rigorous interrogation, but I think it is the most interesting place at the moment probably in this space, but I don't talk about it. The how literature I referred to, um, essentially comes up with five uh, steps uh, or five themes to uh, essentially cultivate the emergence of innovation. Um, and uh, the pricing one, of course, is obvious from our point of view. But I would, I won't go through the nuance of the article, but I think it's very interesting because it kind of develops uh, the headings I've given you here are um, kind of seem self-evident in a way, support environmentally friendly R&D. But what that paper does is dig under the hood a bit and see, well, what about the arrangements or the mix of research and so on? And one thing that comes out of the American experience, which they cite, is that government conducted research. The US, as you know, has research laboratories that are supported by the government, and that they uh, can be especially important in bridging between basic science and applied science and so on. Um, the early stage deployment issue, uh, they talk about the evidence that shows, which again seems obvious when you think about it, but we don't do it much, is to help reduce the uh, first-of-a-kind costs incurred by the first mover, because they are, uh, can be very, very large and intimidating collaborative research and so on. So I commend that work to you. It's just been published in REAP. Um, I want to talk about the US a bit uh, because it has had some surprising performance without carbon prices. There's none at the federal level to speak of. There's no cap, there's no trading scheme and so on. Uh, but um, as many of you will be aware, uh, CO2 emissions increased steadily over the 1990-2005 period. But then they peaked and uh, declined by 20% compared to, to 2005 in the power sector. And the interesting question is, why did this uh, happen? Obviously, you had a recession in the middle, so that's important to address. But um, a difference in difference study, which uh, is not very legible probably to you here, but the essence of it is that uh, interrogating the data carefully, one of my colleagues at uh, EDF, Christina Molan, led the work, um, essentially concludes that uh, natural gas substituting for coal and petroleum accounts for 60% of the reduction and uh, large increase in renewable energy generation for 30%. Um, and then there's a kind of a narrative there about the uh, nuances and so on. Um, but uh, what's interesting is why that happened. Um, 
And um, in the uh, natural gas case, as you will all be aware, of course, it was the fracking revolution that uh, dramatically increased the supply of natural gas and dramatically reduced its cost and therefore its share of the uh, consumption bundle. And that, of course, uh, had a, excuse me, a major effect on emissions at the uh, point of uh, combustion. Um, uh, the, uh, what was surprising, and I think this is why Mullen's work is worth uh, dwelling on, the conventional wisdom was that the explanation for the fall was entirely a natural gas narrative. But in fact, when you interrogate the data, renewables account for 30%. And uh, that's surprising to me. Also, what goes against the kind of noise you hear in the States is that most of it is a product of wind energy. There's a huge kind of infatuation with, with uh, solar and uh, the, the historic period we're talking about is essentially a, a wind uh, story. Um, there is, well, I'll, um, that kind of just tells the story the easiest graph to capture the thing is the top right hand one where the top line is the consumption of electricity from wind generation. The yellow line below is the uh, consumption of, from uh, solar. Um, but you can see a fairly dramatic um, projection. The bottom right one I put in because I think it's important in the States you hear a lot of um, uninformed comment about the subsidies in Germany and the incredible costs of that and of course there were huge deadweight losses there um, but the system did adjust pretty quickly to reduce the uh, the subsidies and that kind of captures that uh, that that policy response. It was uh, probably too slow and too little and so on, but it, it did happen. Um, the fracking is interesting because there are kind of two core, I mean, there are many reasons why it happened, uh, but one was there was federal research and in fact behind virtually every American big success story you'll find federally funded research at its root. Um, uh, but the second big leg, of course, that it was brought to commercial fruition by George Mitchell, whose father, by the way, was Greek, a Greek herder. Um, and Mitchell and his company uh, essentially had a lease on the Barnett Shale in Texas. It was running out of conventional gas. Um, and they essentially read the literature and said, okay, there is an opportunity here to convert this apparently dead resource into a live commercial proposition. Um, I'll come back to this, but they began in 1981 and kept experimenting and produced the first commercial gas in 1997. So there's a 16-year gap between the uh, initial proposition and action and uh, achieving the outcome. Um, on the renewables side, of course, uh, we know Denmark was a pioneer in the research and development side of things. Germany created the demand at scale, but the US also was very active in research, especially in uh, supporting innovation on the turbine technology and the components uh, thereof. And then finally the China contribution uh, brought the cost down through manufacturing scale. So you had in both of these cases, you had uh, tremendous uh, research that underpinned the concept. Then you had extraordinary entrepreneurial courage and leadership over a very long period. Um, it's striking that uh, Denmark uh, essentially developed its technology in the 80s, but today uh, it still accounts for less than 50% of electricity. So it's a very, very slow, long process to go from concept to big impact. The co-costs and benefits, of course, are, uh, are uh, important. Uh, the Environmental Defense Fund, from whom I've just stopped working, 
uh, did some really important work because, of course, they somebody in the organization said, wait a minute, uh, is natural gas as good as it's supposed to be? We know that it's much more efficient at the combustion level, but what about the leaks and losses from the uh, uh, extraction, uh, drilling and extraction, right through to the, the in other words, the uh, supply chain? And it's taken a long time, but the science is more or less complete now, and they've concluded that the uh, Losses are about 2.4% along the supply chain. And that substantially, it doesn't completely undermine, of course, the, uh, the uh, net contribution. But it certainly uh, dramatically uh, um, reduces the kind of uh, greenhouse gas net benefit in terms of climate to the, con what the conventional wisdom has been saying. And now a lot of our advocacy at the Environmental Defense Fund is essentially to address the uh, leaks along the supply chain. And many European companies are at the forefront in, uh, in addressing that. Um, a third strand that I've kind of dabbled, got into through the usual kind of random events is energy storage as, uh, and the, the kind of innovation narrative that seems to be emerging there, which uh, has many American dimensions. Um, Jeff Heal, who's at Columbia, uh, Jeff essentially has for many years felt that battery storage is a key constraint in terms of meeting the kind of Paris commitments by 2050 uh, and beyond. Um, and he kind of converted that kind of hypothesis into a nice paper that we published in REAP. We kind of worked through what it would cost, basically, in terms of um, addressing energy storage so that the intermittency problem could be properly addressed of renewables. Um, and uh, naturally, he came up with a range of high and low uh, costs, but they're not zero. They're very, very uh, significant. So, Rick, if you're interested in a kind of a grassrootsy kind of look at that whole issue, I think Jeff's paper is worth uh, having a, having a go at. Um, in terms of innovation, of course, um, you can see a number of things uh, going on. Um, the research, and there's a research lab specifically on energy storage, and this goes back to my earlier point about how our research is organized is very, very important in terms of innovation kind of impact. But the, um, uh, this lab concentrates entirely on this, uh, this, this issue, and it does act as a bridge between the Department of Energy funds a lot of basic research and so on. So you have two strands of things going on. You have the research and demonstration, uh, which is government and academic work. Um, over the last few years, uh, there's been a very encouraging development in the Federal Energy and Regulatory Commission, where they successively, for the last four years, have essentially said, we in the regulatory system are going to, at the very least, uh, level the playing field and make storage, uh, you know, make sure that it's not discriminated against and can be discriminated in favor of in certain circumstances and so on. The reason why that's important, of course, is that this organization regulates electricity across the U.S. So once it starts moving into regulator design to drive a proper uh, incentive strategy for storage, of course, you have a hugely transformative force. Um, so you see a dramatic fall in costs. Jeff uh, documents this. Uh, the third strand, of course, I should have put on there, and I think it's in the paper. I'm drafting on this, of course, is the entrepreneurial, the Elon Musk phenomenon, where you have uh, somebody who is extremely uh, 
uh, wealthy and extraordinarily courageous in the sense of taking really big risks to advance a particular vision, really. Um, and of course, he has, in a way, mainstreamed the whole battery uh, debate or the storage debate and its uh, execution into longer and longer ranges and lower and lower costs and so on. Uh, but in spite of his efforts, the research and the regulatory push, uh, there's still a very interesting gap between uh, costs and natural gas peaking, which of course is in the uh, power sector the fallback. Um, this is a very interesting piece that colleagues at EDF have just published. Uh, and essentially it shows the kind of more or less horizontal line uh, along the bottom is the costs of uh, natural gas peaking power. And the declining line is the evidence from reverse auctions showing that when you commission uh, storage, uh, essentially, that's what you get. And you can see even when you project out, as they've done, 2018, there's quite a gap yet. So, there, so in other words, there's much, much more innovation badly needed to drive this, uh, this fall in costs to the point where uh, the kind of heel vision can be achieved at relatively uh, modest cost. Uh, I'll pause for a second there and see if do people have a thought on this kind of American experience and its relevance or not? In a way, this is interesting, but what, what I'm, in terms of policy, so you want to create the incentives for innovators to innovate, right? And I'm wondering to what extent um, you want to design a system that is the speaking winner. So going back to your idea, of what is the policy? Yeah, I mean, a policy a tax that is high enough would be ideal. But if you cannot get that, what, how do you get a level playing field or actually something that is uh, sufficiently stable and sufficiently convincing to, to justify these guys? Um, so I'm, yeah, I guess I'm, uh, so today what, what what I will uh, present later is actually something that has to do with the fact that firms actually do not operate at an efficient frontier, that firms are, have all sorts of other constraints. So whatever you can do to make this aspect salient for firms is important. And I'm just um, now uh, struggling with finding another policy that does what a policy, a stable long-run policy or energy tax would do. So. Yeah, um, despite being an expert, as you said, I, I still cannot come up with uh, a solution. Sorry. Um, what the narrative I'm going to tell you is what not to do. It's slightly different about what one should do. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yep. When we talk about uh, innovation, it's maybe useful to distinguish between incremental and radical innovation. Because the private sector can do everything, of course, in, with respect to incremental innovation. They're designed to do this. Eh? But if, you, if you take a look at the work of Mazzucato and Norberg Bohm, they all conclude that radical innovations most likely come out of publicly funded R&D programs. Like in the US case, it's, it's well documented that if, uh, all the big revolutions came out of public R&D. So that's what also Mazzucato sees happening in China. They replicated the American model to push renewables at a gigantic scale based on, of course, public R&D, then uh, public-private partnerships, and then rolling out in the market with designed incentives like subsidies, initial market creation, and things like that. So I think it's, it's critical to, to be clear about what type of innovation do we need. Is it radical or incremental? And then, of course, the mechanism can play a role. My, my, the evidence we seem to have in Europe is, say, from the trading scheme, and there's a workshop tomorrow which will, is that you get incremental innovation from the kind of prices that float around 20 or 30 euros, uh, but you don't get radical change. So as far as I, I think we need both, but my kind of preliminary hypothesis is that uh, 
and we have an instrument for getting incremental if we get a price, uh, but we don't have an instrument for driving big change. You know, that's that's just a thought. But I agree with you. It's the big shiny bauble of the huge disruption that changes everything is uh, probably over seductive, and we should I pay more attention to the incremental change as well. Okay, I'll keep going. The venture capital narrative is fascinating. A friend at uh, MIT just brought this piece of work to my attention, Frank O'Sullivan. Um, and essentially, they did a really lovely ex post analysis of clean energy venture capital uh, in the US in the 2006 2011 period. And the results uh, and the kind of counterfactual or the, 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 were the medical uh, pharma kind of investment, an ICT uh, investment. And the half of uh, the 25 billion that, in, that um, venture capitalists put into clean tech over that five year period was lost, basically. And the returns were dramatically lower than those yielded over the same period in medical and software and so on. Um, and the question is, is why? And they, uh, it's a business school in MIT who kind of do the why bit, and it's quite interesting, I think. The preamble, of course, is how the uh, venture capital market works, which many of you will already know this, I'm sure. But they operate on a 10-year cycle, um, and the model is that the expectation within the first five years is that those very few that turn out to have commercial prospects will be purchased by uh, large cash risk companies. Uh, the key point that he, they make, the authors, of course, is that in the uh, medical and IT world, you have huge cash-rich companies that buy out innovation. So there's a market there. Or they issue an initial public offering, an, I, an IPO. Um, and, of course, when uh, uh, you look at clean tech, this does not apply. Uh, the other differences were that the money they needed, there was a kind of a kind of an almost an operating model in the VC world that if you put 10 million in, that would be enough to get something going to the point where it could be commercial. It turned out that uh, developing new materials, hardware and so on, the kind of thing you have to do to transform clean tech, uh, takes much more time and much more money. Um, and they couldn't attract corporate acquirers. So that money essentially went down the, the tubes. So I think it's quite important to learn those lessons because, uh, uh, I mean, it's a tribute to the American risk-taking appetite, I think, that in spite of that, um, the uh, funding levels were kind of operating at around five billion a year. They haven't gone to zero. They're still at one to two billion. So there's still people hanging in there, so, so to speak. Um, there is a new model, which I think is interesting and also I think is relevant, of course, for Europe, perhaps. But Bill Gates, as some of you will probably know, has got together with a group of wealthy investors called the Breakthrough Energy Coalition. Uh, they have pledged funding, so this is the kind of venture capital bit. But they're working closely with uh, governments, 20 countries. This is slightly old information, so it's probably bigger than this now, called Mission Innovation. And their point, of course, is without the basic R&D, you don't have a you know, a successful narrative to uh, to uh, lean on. Um, now that's just got going, and when you look at this website, it's uh, surprisingly opaque in terms of what it doesn't tell you about what they're doing. Uh, but it's an interesting effort to have learned the lessons of early the first uh, five years and to come to a new. Um, it's worth dwelling a little bit on the whole venture capital story. Um, in the top 15 regions of the world, the US accounts for 64%, China for 15, and Europe for 12, and then the rest. 
And Japan, interestingly, is, doesn't feature in the venture capital world, uh, but is the leader, the global leader, or at least for that data that I looked at, uh, uh, on patents. Um, and that tells me that Japan is depending mainly on incumbents to drive innovation, whereas the Americans are depending on new entrants to, uh, to drive it. And Europe is probably mostly incumbent-led. A worrying thing about Europe is that that 12%, a large chunk of that, is, uh, comes out of the UK, um, and who, of course, as we sadly know, will no longer be in the Union. Um, now, um, how to achieve this? Uh, I did late at night, and when I looked at it this morning, it didn't make a lot of sense to me. So, uh, but I just go through. I won't plod through it, but I would recommend there. I give a reference to Enrico Moretti's book, The New Geography of Jobs. It's kind of old now. It's 2012. He's an Italian native who is now working in Berkeley. Uh, but it's a terrific uh, look at the whole issue of innovation hubs and brain hubs, where they are, how they are, why they happened, and so on. Um, he makes a point, uh, with, uh, which is obvious, I suppose, that luck is a huge factor in explaining these dynamic regional economies. And uh, Bill Gates and um, his team, as you probably know, had set up Microsoft in New Mexico. In, um, initially. And uh, Gates was from Seattle and his mother kept phoning him to tell him to come home and, uh, and he did. <laughs> and the point that Moretti makes, of course, is that New Mexico would now be the leader in the world because of course all the spin-offs are just... So anyway, it's, it's a fascinating read in terms of what it takes, how they exist. But the, the key... Well, I'll, uh, innovation characteristics are th labor markets are huge. He essentially, you know, that's his dominant narrative. That the reason people keep going to unbelievably expensive places to start businesses and to keep them going is because of the depth of the uh, labor market. The ecosystem is crucial. Um, I was with the mayor of Palo Alto a few years ago and he took me around and there's a, there's a cafe in Palo Alto, just outside Palo Alto, called Box, which has a bunch of booths and apparently that's where all the deals are done. So the developer of the idea, the financiers, the IP lawyers, all of these guys meet in a booth and cut the deal essentially. But they're all there, the point is, and they all show up. and. Uh, and uh, buttermilk pancakes, for those of you who are interested in culinary matters, uh, is the diet of uh, choice in this particular place. Um, what's striking also in all of these places is the tolerance for risk. There's this unbelievable enthusiasm for having a go. And roughly you operate between 10 and 20, you know, investments and assume that one or two will come through and the returns will be big enough to justify the risk. Finally, just turning to Europe, and I'm getting very close to the end here. I quote Jeffrey Immelt, unfortunately I can't find the year in which he said this, but he was the CEO of GE. And the fact that GEO's share prices have absolutely tanked in recent times might diminish the credibility of what he says. But at that time, whatever it was, he said, America is the leading consumer of energy. However, we're not the technical leader. Europe today is the major force for environmental innovation. Um, so the question really is, is uh, was it true then? Uh, is it, if so, is it still true? It's a very, very important uh, question. Um, in general, what, uh, what I conclude just from my cursory kind of gallop through what's going on is that uh, Europe is very strong on the framing and the kind of language and the kind of enabling side of things, uh, perhaps less so in coming out the other end with big scale commercial breakthroughs. Uh, the Regional Development Fund, for example, I won't quote it there, but essentially they 
uh, talk about a shift toward the low code and circular economy and the fight climate change and so on. So this is, as those of you who are not from Europe will know, this is the huge funding vehicle that's between three and four hundred billion that's channeled to poorer regions. But even in that vehicle, the whole climate agenda, the circular economy, is kind of embedded in the language and in the way people think and presumably reflects a little bit what is actually likely to be funded. The big thing that Europe has going for it, of course, is that it has coherence, which is a very rare quality in the climate policy world. We have binding targets, uh, a minimum of minus 40% to 2030. We have a set of policy instruments that will get us there and uh, make sense, more or less. Um, um, and then, uh, and it, it's divided, as we know, between the trading, heavy industry, power sector, and the rest, and so on. Um, and California has the same, perhaps slightly sharper in focus, but those are the two big jurisdictions globally where the pieces of the jigsaw are in place in terms of objectives and means and uh, the kind of force of the uh, legislative underpinning. Um, there are two other things that Europe has which are kind of relevant, I think. The first is the European strategy, the set plan it's called. And the second is the innovation fund. The innovation fund essentially uh, sets aside 450 million allowances from the 2021 to 7 period. And uh, depending on the price, which I've listed down the left, uh, you're looking at a revenue between 4.5 and 13.5 billion. So it's not huge money, but neither is it trivial. Um, but, and I'll pose a few questions on this front, I think it's still an open question as to whether we will play a significant role in the creation of innovations that make it much cheaper and so on. Um, and scale is critical, so we we'll do lots of things uh, at the margin, the kind of incremental thing that Johan was talking about, which is of course critically important, but I have my doubts about the, uh, the other side of things. We have positives, of course. We have the R&D tradition that came out of uh, Denmark. We have Germany's critical role and so on. What's interesting is that if you look at these, I mean, the one I looked at is the Global Clean Tech Innovation Index. And seven of the top 10 countries are European. So, uh, but when I looked, interrogated the criteria, they're very kind of input focused and not so much looking at big outputs. Um, the set plan, uh, I think, is interesting, and I'll be interested in your views on this. Um, so I'm finishing with these five questions. Um, encouraging new entrants. I might be over-obsessing about this, but I do think they're key to innovation. It's not clear to me that the EU has an ecosystem that enables and supports disruptors. Uh, incumbents, of course, are important, but on their own, I don't think they'll do what needs to be done. Access to venture capital, I've already flagged as an issue, and the departure of the UK is a concern. Um, uh, it would be interesting, and some of you all may know this, to whether the European Union is engaged with Gates' Breakthrough Energy Coalition, because that is a possible vehicle for us in Europe to be, you know, big players in this whole venture capital, new entrant, disruptor world. Um, the innovation hubs that Moretti kind of works through, I think, are interesting. We have them, of course, in Europe. We have the Life Sciences Cluster in Paris and Cambridge, ICT in Stockholm, and others, of course. Um, the question is, is there scope for an innovation hub or hubs or bits of hubs? Because it may not make sense to think of a singular one that can pull in the kind of talent that it needs to really transform things, that attracts risk takers, finance, and so on. It's a question, I think, that uh, we should 
dwell upon. So I'm going to go through these questions and then we can have a few minutes to discuss them. Um, so just to go back, the first one is a new entrance, the other is related to the innovation hubs. The third is a set plan. I don't know if some of you may be researching this. Uh, I kind of went through what I could find and some of it is pretty impressive, I think, in terms of framing the issues, developing networks. Uh, but it's not clear to me, but I could be completely wrong, that it has the funding, the welcome for new entrants and so on, that would that you could see it as a key driver for climate innovation. The Innovation Fund sounds wonderful because it has the right name. Um, and I'm kind of worried, though, because when I looked at the documentation, the description of the work says most of the resource used to support investments in the generation of electricity, blah, blah, blah. Uh, all of which are very important, but the word innovation doesn't appear there. So I'm just wondering, have we dropped that ball completely or what's going on there? Um, email, of course, is uh, this true? Um, this, uh, well, uh, yeah, this is an important, probably the most important slide, actually, of the whole uh, thing. And it's about the timing issue. I mentioned to get these big, and this is why urgency is at the heart of things. Um, but if you look at the Danish wind experience or look at Mitchell's fracking thing, you're looking at time, time, time. In Ireland, we beat New Zealand uh, last week uh, after 111 years of trying. Americans go on about, I think it's the Boston White Sox or something that took 60 years to win the baseball, whatever it is, Super Bowl world, whatever. Anyway, we in Ireland, you know, that's a trivial thing compared to us. So, um, to show you, uh, to cheer you up, or at least to cheer me up, um, I just want to uh, show you the winning try here, which uh, <laughs> I know will bring joy to your hearts. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> 